Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Sunday at FCC. Glad you could be here today. Let's pray. We are in your house, Lord, to meet with you. We thank you that you want to meet with us. We come from all different walks of life and that challenges in life and experiences this week. And you've been walking every step of the way with us. And we're here to say thank you for that. For whatever challenges you brought into our life this week, you helped us meet those challenges. You brought us joy and sorrow, challenge, maybe even maybe even happiness. And we want to see you even clearer today. The sun is shining bright. The sun that's in the sky. But how about your sun in our hearts? Have we turned to you or have we turned away? Have we walked with you or have we tried to go our own way? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves and meditate upon. How have we acted to our, our fellow human being this week? Have we reached out and blessed them or have we given them a scornful look? Your, your son, Father, is the only one who ever walked this earth in a way that was completely righteous and holy and perfect. He is the one we are to emulate and imitate. And yet we know by our own human strength that is impossible. But with your power that lives in us, we can do immeasurably, immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine. We are your humble servants today, Lord. We want, to be, we want to be the salt and light. We want to be your ambassadors. We want to be able to embrace others and bring them into the fold. And, but we only do that if we can Yield to your spirit. So Lord, today as we get into your word a little bit, grant us understanding. Grant us sight. Spiritual sight. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Joshua chapter 4. See, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm kind of echoing here, but I guess maybe it's just my microphone. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, from one each tribe, one from each tribe. Tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he, he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said, Go over before the ark of, your, of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you should take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes in Israel, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial for the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as jo Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they, and they are there to this day. 
Well, as some of you may know, uh, the King family spent some time up in the Aleutian Islands. I don't know if you know where that's at, but it's off the coast of Alaska. It's part of Alaska, actually. But when I was up there in the Aleutian Islands, it didn't take me long to be there before I realized, hey, this is the perfect climate for, uh, for growing tulips. Um, wet, misty, cold, foggy weather. Probably the same, same latitude on the map as, say, Holland. Not Holland, Michigan, but Holland, the, the country. And I thought to myself, what could be better than to bring a splash of color to this often dreary lang landscape of Akutan? That's the name of the island we lived on, Akutan. Sounds like some sort of a prescription drug, doesn't it? But anyway, but where to plant the tulips? Where are we going to plant the tulips at? I decided the best place to plant them would be where the passerbyers could see. And that would be at the end of the driveway, right, uh, which intersected the only, only road in, on the whole island, the driveway and the other road. And I thought, perfect, right there at the corner. People walk by there all the time. They would go into the village to, oh, just to get away from the seafood processing plant for a bit. But there was a big problem here, and that was there was a huge pile of rocks at that spot. This would mean it would be some, take some very hard work on my part but I was not deterred. Whether it was raining, whether it was wet sunshine, I don't know what was going on outside, I began moving these rocks with all diligence. And some of the rocks turned out to be very large rocks. When it was completed, as I did all this, and I, it appeared that I didn't progress very far. I looked at it, all I, all I had was three tiny spots of land or little plots of ground bordered by a bunch of immovable boulders. I decided I could not move. And I wrote this landscaping project off as something, you know, a uh, complete failure. Ah, well, I gave, it a, I gave it the old college try. But in the end, it was, looked like to me a very dismal failure. But then, spring arrived. And we looked out there, and we saw the most brilliant red and yellow tulips. They sprang forth. And many of the people who walked by, they said to themselves, wow, those are the prettiest tulips I've ever seen. And it did really stand out against the stark, the, the contrast, the bland contrast of the, the mud and the dry grass and stuff up there. Sometimes when we look around to see where we should plant the seeds of the gospel, what do we see? We see hard, rocky soil. When we see this, we often become, we become discouraged. We become somewhat intimidated by the fact. Sometimes we feel weak. Sometimes we feel, feel useless. It's like, wow, you know, I mean, why isn't anybody responding? I felt all those feelings at one time and another when I looked out in my office window sometimes and I, I see the next generation passing by the window. How are we going to reach them? I asked myself. They don't seem to be too interested in what we, the church has to offer. Is it their fault? I guess in, at some level it is because the Bible says that nobody is, each, each one of us is personally accountable and responsible before God. See Romans chapter 1 for that. But if they're not being reached, then we as a church must take some of that blame upon ourselves, hadn't we? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. To all creation. Yes, that includes your, your neighbor you may not get along with, maybe don't even know their name. That includes friends and strangers, high school students, even junior hires. They're people too, you know. I have to say that it was so easy when I was a Christian teacher to, to preach the gospel there because, quite frankly, they were a captive audience. They couldn't go anywhere. Every day I got to, to teach them about God's marvelous creation through science and math, and they couldn't run away. It was great. I liked that. But they were in what I call the spiritual greenhouse. The temperature and the humidity was fairly constant, helping these little sprouts get off to a good start. That was key. But now I'm not, I'm not in the spiritual greenhouse anymore. We're out here in the harsh, cold, sometimes, well, unforgiving world. 
So it's important for us, we got to do some spiritual landscaping. We all need to get out there and do some spiritual landscaping to prepare the soil for the harvest. And let's face it, that's difficult work. It means trying to move some pretty heavy stones, both in our lives and stones that might, find our, that might be just beyond our driveway. I've been, I've been out to the Chapman farm. They've got some big stones out there along there in their, uh, their lawn. I would like to see them move some of those. That would, have been, that would have been fun. That's what God told Joshua to do in chapter 4. The Israelites had finally crossed the Jordan, entered the Promised Land, but God had one more task for the Israelites to do. And he said, and God said to Joshua, Choose 12 men. Take them from among the people, one from each tribe. Tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, to carry them over with you, put them down in the place where you stay tonight. What, what can we take away from this very interesting assignment that God gave these, these men? How about this? If we, let's assume this for a second, that these 12 men, they crossed the Jordan first, which was probably a mile across. Then they had to return to the middle of the Jordan to collect the rock, which, which, which was in the middle of the river, which, is, which the text seems to suggest, suggest. That would be, so they crossed the Jordan, then they have to go a half mile back into the middle of the Jordan, pick up the rock, and then bring a half a mile back. I don't know about you, but doesn't that seem a bit inconvenient? Why not just find a big rock already on the shore around there? They're probably just the same as the rocks in the middle of the river. Here's the interesting thing. These men haven't spent one night in the promised land yet, and yet they're being called upon God to do a special service. Now that's interesting. Because I know Christians who have spent a lifetime in the promised land and have yet to heed God's call for service. What's God calling you to do? But you keep putting him off. Don't put God off any longer. If you do, he won't give you any more opportunities to serve him. Notice that Joshua was to choose 12 men. Do you think he just picked the first 12 men he saw and said, okay, hey, here's 12 you guys, go do what God said to do right now. What qualities do you think he looked for in men he chose? Obviously, he would choose men who were strong, right? Because Joshua said to them, each of you is to take a stone and put it on his shoulder. Imagine for a moment you were one of those men along with the 11 others, you were chosen by your national leader to represent your entire tribe for a special mission for God. You. Now, let me, guys out there especially, do you really want to come back with the smallest stone of the 12? Can you imagine? What, can, they're sitting around camp at night after that. Can you hear them now? Hey, let's compare the size of our rocks, okay? That's, that's the maturity of men, right? With, hey, oh, whose rock's bigger? Hey, who's that lightweight who brought back that little pebble? Ha ha, back slap. They're going to they're gonna be funning around the campfire. But here's the thing. As we seek to serve God, let's not compare our feats of strength with others, okay? That's not the point. Let our, let, that's a superficial. Instead, let our strength of character, that strength, be the inspiration for others. I believe Joshua didn't pick someone who was physically strong. He needed men who were mentally tough, okay, and who could handle some pain. Carrying heavy rocks back a half a mile on one shoulder was going to take more than brute strength here. It was going to take some mental toughness. I mean, who enjoys picking up heavy rocks and moving them around? Psychologists say that enduring physical pain has a lot to do with our mental makeup, more so than maybe even our physical abilities. 
We've all heard stories of athletes who have endured incredible pain in order to keep playing. One basketball player, and this is a famous story from the NBA, one basketball player from the mid-70s, he actually played an entire game with a broken leg. It was a very important game, I guess. His name was uh, Wes Unseld. He played for the Washington Bullets, which is now extinct. It's not Washington Bullets anymore. They changed it, I guess, way back then. That was too violent, so they changed it to the Washington Wizards now. But you see, serving God is not without pain and hardships, right? Remember Paul, when he went through and he preached, when he preached the gospel, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 11, he said, you know, I've been to prison more frequently, he said. I've been flogged more severely, exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes, minus one. Three times uh, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And one time I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Could you imagine that if you were out in the open sea and, and there was sharks swimming around you, possibly? I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger from the, in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from my false brothers. Detecting a theme here? How could Paul endure all this? If only one of these things were to happen to me, I think I would probably pack up and go home right then. Wouldn't take me much. The only possible answer is that Paul understood and that, and that Christ's love compelled him to move forward, to serve. What are we willing to suffer for the gospel? Finally, I believe Joshua picked men who understood that the seemingly laborious and mundane task of carrying a rock a half a mile, it was more than just a task, it, was, it had spiritual significance. This, is a, this task was, had spiritual significance for the people. You see, they were about to go out, these men, were going to choose a non-living, inanimate object, a dead, dumb rock, you might say, and we're going to give it meaning and purpose. The, the rock was about to become part of a memorial to honor God, to remind people of his great power, his care, his provision, his presence. To do this so that others might come to know and fear him and to follow him. Does this remind you of anything else? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. said, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed into him, into his nostrils, the breath of life. Adam, when you think about it, was nothing more than a dense rock until God breathed into him purpose. He breathed into him purpose and meaning and life. And so it is with us. We are like the rocks at the bottom of the Jordan. We're, doing that. We're not doing anything there. We're just sitting there at the bottom of the river, taking up space. But then we are chosen. We are lifted out. We are carried to the promised land so that we could be part of a monument dedicated to God's glory. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, once we were dead. Now we're living with a purpose. Once we were not a people, now we're people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have found God's forgiveness. Once we were stones at the bottom of the Jordan, now we're part of a monument that points to the goodness and the glory and the power of God. We have been moved. We've been moved by the power of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. We become part of the, the spiritual landscape. Hebrews chapter 10, those are my favorite verses in all the Bible. I suppose probably because I, I grew up on a farm, and in the springtime I always enjoyed seeing that fresh, freshly turned saw. Dad would go out with the plow or, or the disc, I guess the disc first, and, and maybe the plow, or different equipment. 
And so in Hebrews it says, sow for, sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap the fruit of the unfailing love. But he says, says, break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. That, that image just sticks in my mind, to break up the unplowed ground. When you break up the unplowed ground, there is a promise of future, future harvest. But it's not without work and time and energy and effort. And when you do that, it says, when that happens, until he comes and showers righteousness upon us. Well, the good news in all this is that the greatest work has already been done for us. Yeah, it's one thing to stand up here and say, you know, we need to you know, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and work. But it's not like we're, we're the first. We're not, we're not the pioneers here, okay? We're just following in our Lord's footsteps. It was only two weeks ago that we gathered together and we celebrated the fact that another large boulder had been moved. Matthew writes, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. Isn't that kind of, when you think about that, isn't it a comical, a comical picture? So I conclude with this point. God moved that stone for our sakes, not for his son's sake. I want you to think about that for a minute. Mary and Peter and John, they needed a direct line of sight into that tomb so that they could have first-hand knowledge of Jesus' resurrection. That's why God moved the stone. That's why the angel of God moved the stone. It wasn't so Jesus could walk out of the tomb. Jesus could pass through the tomb in any direction at any time he wanted to. But Mary and the disciples, they needed to see with their own eyes the wonder of all wonders so that they could and they would believe. Remember the famous hymn, and I... It's, the name of the hymn is, It is Well with My Soul. The last verse starts out like this. And the Lord haste the day, speaking the day of Christ's return, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. And the clouds, and the clouds will be rolled back like a scroll. When my faith shall be sight. Well, in a sense, the situation I'm speaking about, about the resurrection of Christ, about the, the rolling of the stone away from the tomb, that, that's just the opposite. When God's angel rolled the stone away, we are then given the opportunity to peer into the, the tomb's darkness, into the recesses of the tomb, and we find it empty, and then our sight becomes faith. God moved the stone for our sake. And we'll never forget. Because our sight, well, first it was Mary's sight, and then Peter, and John, and the other disciples, their sight. And through them, our sight, what we beheld with our eyes, or what we behold with our eyes, it transforms into faith. It transforms into a faith that what, what happens? It blooms, it blossoms it, into the splashy, colorful bouquet of hope. Just kind of think about those tulips on Accutan Island. Hope and joy and peace and purpose and courage and, and salvation and eternal life and all these things that sometimes we take for granted But we get these things because of our faith. And we get our faith because we see into the, the empty tomb. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. I, in my youth, moved a bunch of heavy stones of an Accutan. Men in Joshua's time moved some stones to remind not only the tribes in that generation, but for many generations to come of God's power and mercy and saving hand. Now God moved a stone that we could peer into the tomb's darkness and see Jesus is not there and therefore believe. By faith and through God's strength, 
by faith and through God's strength, we too move stones. So that others may have a clear view of the God we serve. That they may see him. They may recognize him. They may put their faith in him and worship him and and have a future with him forever. The Marys asked on that one Sunday morning, they said, who will move the stone? Now we know the answer. God has and God will and we will too by the power of Christ's name. I leave you with these words from Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you his peace. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Go in peace.